Chapter 5 Escape from St. Louis Looking out the small basement window gave him a good view of the street, a street filled with the remains of the neighborhood. Burned out buildings, abandoned cars, and rotting corpses of the unlucky. When bombs fall on a populated city, all you can do is take cover and pray that luck or a higher power is with you. Everyone has the instinct to run. The problem is that you have no idea which way to go. Officer Blankenship couldn't even recognize the street, even though he had patrolled it for many years. This time, however, he wasn't looking for illegal activity. In fact, many of those in the basement with him were wanted or under investigation for one thing or another. None of that mattered these days, and even though he was a police officer, that didn't matter now either. Now the only thing that mattered was survival, and the same went for the gangs that used to control the neighborhoods. Thinking about the group now gathered around him and of which he was unofficially in charge, Officer Blankenship had to let out a little laugh. Here he was in the basement of a building with a little girl he had torn from her now-deceased mother's hands, local citizens, and gun-packing gang members. I would say this is what it would take to get a group like this depending on one another. That, and being attacked by foreign troops, he thought. From what Blankenship could tell, those who fell from the sky days after the EMP were Chinese, and from the minute they touched the ground, their weapons began firing. Few of those hiding with him were even from this neighborhood. Most he had picked up over the last weeks of running and hiding. The one plan for most of them, and the reason they were following Blankenship, was to get out of the city and into the country. They had been moving from building to building in an attempt to avoid the Chinese troops. They had seen what happened to those who were able to find a car or old motorcycle that ran, attempting to drive out. But that only drew the attention of the Chinese, and it always ended badly. Watching smoke rise from buildings in the distance as more bombs fell, Blankenship couldn't help but wonder if the arch was still standing. He knew it was meaningless whether it was or not, but he still couldn't keep from wondering. He had started from near that area the day the attack began, and watched the bridge just beyond the arch blown from its perch high above the Mississippi River. Those first days now just ran together as he thought back on them, but the one thing he did remember was all the people fighting back. As a law enforcement officer, he knew there were many weapons in St. Louis, even though they were not allowed. But he never really understood just how many until now. Had there not been so many armed citizens, he was sure he wouldn't still be alive. For the first few days, the people of St. Louis used everything they had to fight back. But even though they had the firearms, the one thing they didn't have was ammunition. People used their weapons for personal and home defense, except for a very few, and many hadn't planned on using them to battle a foreign invasion. Even officers had little ammunition and carried what they could when leaving the station. Blankenship reached down to his side and placed his hand on the two magazines in their pouches, he found himself checking them regularly, ensuring that they hadn't been lost. Next, he checked his pistol and its magazine, confirming that it still contained all eighteen rounds. Ammunition wasn't easy to get. There was no more running to Walmart or the local sporting goods store. Everyone check your ammunition, Blankenship said as he turned away from the window. He knew some had more than others and wouldn't part with what they possessed. He also knew that they would use it if they had to, if not to protect others, then to protect themselves. Go over and sit with the others, sweetie. He looked down at the little girl who had hardly left his side since it all began. When she wasn't with him, she stayed close to the other children and nobody else. She slowly put her head down and walked over to the others, all of whom looked like they had been making mud pies. Everyone wished they could take a shower, something they had gone without for weeks now. A shower would be asking a lot when just drinking water was so highly desired. Along with ammunition, nobody passed up a bottle containing water. Whether it had been opened or not, they were happy to find it. Once he had seen that most had done as he asked, Blankenship continued speaking. From here on out, it will be mostly residential areas. We will no longer be able to move through buildings. I suggest that we break up into groups. This brought some rumblings and several questions were shouted out. Blankenship held up his hands, trying to quiet them down, 
wanting them to hear everything he had to say before jumping to conclusions. Once he felt that things had quieted enough to continue, he did. We are going to be in the open, moving alongside or behind houses. If we go out as one group, then it will make us easier to spot. Blankenship could tell they understood what he was saying. We'll divide into three groups. Kaylee will stay with me and I'll take three others. Everyone else needs to form two groups. Everyone understand? Blankenship was realistic. He knew that many of them wouldn't make it out of the city. Although they knew they needed to get moving, everyone sat resting, not wanting to be the one to make the suggestion to continue. They all had been running on little sleep and food, but they also knew that if they didn't keep moving, then life would get very difficult, if not end. We staying here for the night? Someone in the group asked. It seemed to Blankenship that there was always somebody asking that question. The more time they spent on the run, the harder it was to keep from giving in and saying yes. Each time he considered giving in, he thought about how much harder it could get to move the next day. Like everyone else, Blankenship had the same question. Where was the army? Even though there was no power and most of the electronics were fried, it had been weeks now. Even on foot, there had to be someone who was able to get a message through to them. That was an issue for another time, if the time ever came. Right now, it was time to answer the question at hand. Even though he wanted to say yes, he didn't. No, we need to get moving while we have light. As he had most every time before, he heard moans coming from the others in response to his answer. In five minutes, we move in three groups. Have them ready. He took a drink of water, placed it back in his pack, and pulled out a small bag of M&Ms. Just as his hand cleared the top of the pack, Kaylee's eyes lit up at the sight of the yellow wrapper. There were only a few left, but it was enough to see her smile, which gave him a little more energy to keep moving the group forward. With everyone ready to go and with Kaylee by his side, Blankenship prepared to exit the basement. When he was satisfied that everything was clear, he began to move out with his group. Once again, they walked down the narrow alleys that separated the property between the rows of houses. They remained quiet as they walked, observing the many homes that had burned either from exploding transformers or bombs. After walking a half mile, Blankenship began noticing curtains moving in the windows of many residential homes. That gave him a little more hope that they had reached the outer perimeter of the Chinese line. Even though it appeared that many people were still in their homes, he and the others were focused on moving forward. Coming from downtown St. Louis, where the fighting had been fierce, many in the group felt pity for those who chose to stay, rather than to run, as they hurried past their curtained windows.